since my sermon today is not really a traditional Palm Sunday kind of message, I thought I'd take just a moment and explain why it is that you have received the Palm and what that tradition is all about. On the day that we call Palm Sunday, we celebrate and remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. He was up on the Mount of Olives. He goes down what's called the Palm Sunday Road today, and he is riding on a donkey and he's heading in towards Jerusalem. The crowds are gathered along the way and they are shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And it is a marvelous time. The scripture tells us that they either laid their cloaks or palms in the, in the path in front of Jesus. Much the same way as we would roll out the red carpet, I suspect, today. But I think there's even more meaning for us than that. In the Jewish faith, in the fall of the year, the last festival of the year is the festival of the harvest. And at the festival of the harvest, they build a tabernacle out of their field, a symbolic place where they worship the Lord and thank him for the harvest. It sits out there all winter long through the rain and the snow, through the dry times. They've cut these branches and they've built them out there. And then in the spring, they remove it so that they can prepare their fields for planting again. They normally would take one branch of that Sukkoth booth and they would use it to light the fire for the Passover lamb. And in Jesus' day, many worshipers would have gone to Jerusalem for Passover so that they could gather there. They were obligated to do that. Perhaps some of them had fresh cut palms. And perhaps some of them had a branch that came from their booth that they had prepared in the field. And we remember that Jesus has come to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He is the sacrificial Lamb who is coming. And so on this Palm Sunday, we remember who Jesus is and what it is that he has done for us. So when you take that palm branch with you today and take it home, may it be a reminder to you that Jesus has come to be our Savior and our Lord, and it's our obligation to worship and magnify his name. If you have your Bible today, turn there to John chapter 9. We're reading the entire chapter. And while you're turning to your Bible, I want to express my appreciation to Todd for being our worship leader today. It was his first time to be worship leader. He did an excellent job. I teased him a little bit as I was coming up to play the drums, and I said, now you're on today for prayer. And he said, yeah, for after the offering. And they looked at me and said, not for the big prayer. It would be a whole lot shorter than yours. And I said, being a whole lot shorter wouldn't necessarily be a bad idea for him as well. <laughs> he did a great job. Thank you, Tom. John chapter 9 and beginning with verse 1. As Jesus went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who said this man or his parents that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud, put it in my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and watch. So I went and watched, and then I could see. Where is this man? They asked him. I don't know, he said. They brought him to the Pharisees, the man who had been born blind. Now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees, who also asked him how he had received his sight, he put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed, and now I see. 
Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, How can a sinner do such marvelous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What, what do you have to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight, and so they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind, but how he can see now or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been born blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind. Now I see. Then they asked him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I told you already, and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become one of his disciples also? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, You were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had turned him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, You have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and that those who see will become blind. Some Pharisees who were with him heard him say and ask, What? Are we blind too? Jesus said, If you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. May God's blessing be added to the reading and the hearing of his word. In John's Gospel, there are seven miracle stories. And this is the sixth of those seven miracle stories. We've been looking at them since, since the season of Lent has begun. We will conclude this next Sunday on the day of resurrection with the great story, the miracle of the resurrection of Lazarus, and we'll look at it in comparison to the resurrection of Jesus. I love this story. Men, you will love this story also. Not that the women won't, but men. You will love this story also. In this story, Jesus has had an encounter previously with the Pharisees. They have been challenging him. They have been chastising him. They have been rebuking him. They have done all of those things. And Jesus is walking along. He is in Jerusalem. And he sees this man who is born blind. He has been blind from birth. He has never been able to distinguish light from darkness. He is a blind man. He has never seen anything. He has never read anything. He is forced to sit alongside the road and beg for his livelihood. Everybody has seen this man. No one has paid any attention to him. And as they are walking along, the disciples ask Jesus, Now this man over here who is born blind, did he sin or did his parents sin? What has caused his blindness. Now, I want you to understand something. We do not believe in the Christian church and the transmigration of souls. We do not believe in reincarnation. 
Some would have believed that this man had sinned in a previous life, and when he was born now, he was born blind to pay for the sins of a previous life. We do not hold to that. The transmigration of souls. And Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that the glory of God might be revealed in his life. Now I want to take a moment and tell you that all illness and disease is a result of sin. In the Garden of Eden, when God first created mankind and put him in the Garden of Eden, there was no sin. There was no illness. There was no disease. Until such time as Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruits and were cast out of the Garden, and sin entered into the world, and we have dealt with illness and disease since then. Now, I want you to listen to this. All illness and disease is a result of sin but it may not be the result of your sin. You may have an illness or a disease that you are dealing with or that you have dealt with in the past, and it might not be a result of your sin. It might be the fact that you're simply human and that you have inherited the sin of humanity, we all have, and that the illness or disease that you're dealing with has come to you and is plaguing you now. So this man has been born blind. And the disciples see him and they ask this question. And Jesus' answer is not what we would expect. Jesus' answer is, this man was born blind so that the glory of God may be revealed in him. Now I want you to think about seeing for a moment. Seeing has multiple concepts for us. There's physical seeing, where we look at something and we see what it is that we're looking at. And then there is this issue of enlightenment, where we suddenly realize something and we see it, maybe, for the first time. And that's a different definition for vision or for seeing than what we've had from the past. When I was a teenager, uh, my pastor and his wife, Preston and Marie Lucas, had a friend of theirs named Lois Paul who would come to visit. And Lois was blind and had been blind since birth. She could not distinguish light from darkness. She did the most beautiful bead work that you could imagine. She would make things out of beads and sew beads together in, in beautiful patterns. I don't think I could do that with, with vision. And she did it without any vision. She also, once you were introduced to her the first time, seemingly never forgot anybody. And you would simply walk into the room and sometimes, even before you said anything, she would identify you. Well, hello, Mike. How are you today? I said, how did you know it was me? She said, I could smell you. And I don't think it meant that I stank. <laughs> Although I have in a few moments. But, you know, we all have a smell. My grandchildren love the little blanket that I sometimes cover myself with at night. And they'll pick it up and it smells like papaw. They know it's mine because of the smell. She certainly understood and recognized people because of their voice. People walk in and say, hi, Lois. And she'd say, hi. And she'd call you by name once she knew you. It was remarkable to me. This lady had such a deep faith also. Having not ever seen the scriptures didn't mean she didn't see the scriptures. She knew and understood God's word, and she believed. So they're walking along, and they see this man who is blind. And Jesus calls him over. Now, men, you're going to like this next part of the story. Jesus spits on the ground. I don't know about you, but I get in trouble sometimes for spitting. 
Next time that happens, I'm going to remind that person, Jesus spit on the ground and look what happened. It's your pass for spitting. Jesus spits on the ground and with the saliva and the soil there, notice John, I didn't say dirt. You've educated me well. With the saliva and the soil, he makes mud and he puts it in the blind man's eyes and he sends him off to the pool of Siloam to wash. And when the man washes, he is suddenly able to see. Now I'm intrigued by Jesus' healing of blind people. And I think there are five different blind people who are healed in the Gospels. And every one of them happens differently. Jesus doesn't do it the same way twice. There's a lesson there for us. Just because someone has had this happen to him doesn't mean that it should happen the same way to me. When I first understood my call to ministry, I was sitting at the back of the sanctuary one uh, Sunday evening after the service was over with my pastor, and, and the pastor had spoken that evening on the story of Saul going into Damascus. You remember the story of Saul going into Damascus? By the way, Damascus is in Syria. And Saul was on the way into Damascus. He's going there with the intention of arresting Christians and bringing them for persecution. When he is struck by this great light, and what happens to Saul? He is blind. And they take him on into Damascus, the straight street, and a man comes and prays for him, and something like scales fall off of Paul's eyes, and he is able to see. So a pastor has preached on that message this Sunday evening, and pastor and I are sitting in the back of the sanctuary, and a man who's been a member of the church for a long time comes, he's already left the building, and he comes back in and he says, Pastor, can I talk to you for a moment? And I said, well, I'll, I'll just excuse myself. I'll just go ahead and leave now. And the guy said, no, no, you can hear what I'm going to say to the pastor. And so he says to the pastor, you know, I've never had an experience like Saul on the road to Damascus. I don't know whether I'm really saved or not. And the pastor looked at him and said, have you ever been on the road to Damascus? And the guy said, I don't even know where Damascus is. The pastor said to this man, you're a hunter, aren't you? And the guy said, yes, I love to hunt. And the pastor said, now when you go hunting for squirrel, do you use the same gun that you would use if you were hunting a black bear? Oh, no, pastor. If you shot a squirrel with that that bear gun, you'd blow it to smithereens. You'd have nothing left when you were done. You use a different gun for a squirrel than you do for hunting bear. Pastor looked at him and said, don't you think God does different things for different people? He doesn't have the same approach. None of us have been on the road to Damascus. But all of us can come to know Jesus as our Savior and Lord. We may not have an exact moment like Saul did. But we can see Jesus. So this man is healed of his blindness. And Jesus has slipped away and they take the man in front of the Pharisees. And the Pharisees say to him, who did this and how did this happen? And he said, a man named Jesus. I don't really know much about him, but a man named Jesus. He spit on the ground. He took some, he made some mud, put in my eyes, sent me down to the pool to wash. And when I washed, I could see. And they said, this man's a sinner. And the man says, well, I don't know whether he's a sinner or not, but this is what I know. I was blind. Now I can see. I think John does a marvelous job in this story of comparison and contrast between those who can see and those who can't see. And he transitions it this story from physical to spiritual. This man could not see physically, but now he can see physically. He also sees spiritually. He knows that Jesus has healed him. The Pharisees who have eyesight but no vision can't see that Jesus is the Christ. Uh, 
I want you to understand that there are a lot of people in our world today who can tell you something about Jesus. <coughs> they can tell you perhaps that Jesus was born in Bethlehem. They can tell you perhaps that Jesus rode a donkey on the way into Jerusalem on the day that we called Palm Sunday. They can tell you perhaps that Jesus was crucified, buried, and risen again. They can tell you perhaps a lot of different things about Jesus. They can tell you that Jesus has healed the blind, that Jesus has walked on the water, that Jesus has healed the lame, that Jesus has resurrected Lazarus. They can tell you lots of things about Jesus. But you know, the issue is not what we know about Jesus. The issue is, have you seen Jesus? Have you trusted him to be your Savior and Lord? Have you seen him with spiritual eyes and not physical eyes? They dismiss the man. And they begin pontificating, I like that word, they begin pontificating about who they are and how important they are. And after all, we're Pharisees and, and we know more about everything than anybody. And so they call the man back again and they ask him the same question again. They said, well, how did this happen? He said, I've already told you once. Did you want to be one of his disciples also? Wow, what an insight. Did you want to be one of his disciples also? I've already told you how this happened. And they said, this man is a sinner. And the, the blind, the formerly blind guy says, will God bring healing through a sinner? Oh. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there is that thing that you used to be blind but now you can see and they said we're disciples of Moses and he says okay that's nice did Moses ever heal a man blind this man has healed me of my blindness now you see, the day on which this happened was a Sabbath day. And certain things can and should not happen on a Sabbath day. And one of the issues is work. You should not work on a Sabbath day. Jesus has been confronted on this issue on a number of occasions. On one occasion, when they asked Jesus about working on the Sabbath day, he says, if your donkey falls into a ditch on the Sabbath day, you're going to get it out. You're not going to say, sorry, donkey. You're going to wait till tomorrow. No, you're going to get your donkey out. Now, I would suggest to you if the donkey falls into the ditch all the time, maybe it's time for a new donkey. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you have to do what you have to do on the Sabbath day. Jesus is not routinely doing work on the Sabbath day, but here is a man who is blind, and Jesus has opportunity to do something for this man in restoring sight or giving sight to this man, and it just happens to be a Sabbath day. I would suggest to you it would be wrong for Jesus not to have done this on the Sabbath day. So where are you and I in this story? Are you and I in the Pharisee seat? We know all the rules and we know all the regulations and we know what's supposed to happen and when it's supposed to happen. And, you know, we don't spit on the ground and, you know, all, all of those kind. We know the rules. When I was a child and I was uh, in church with my parents one Sunday evening, the uh, coming from the, uh, we always called it the vestibule, the proper word is narthex, from the narthex into the sanctuary, there were swinging doors. 
And when they opened and shut, they made a noise. And we were sitting there, and the service had already started this particular Sunday evening, and the door squeaked. Well, you know, everyone's going to turn around and look. And in comes a guy wearing a pair of bib overalls and a blue chambray work shirt and clod hoppers that still had clod on them. <laughs> And the pastor preached these messages that night, and the Holy Spirit was at work. And when the pastor gave an altar call, this man responded to the altar call, went to the forward and not at the prayer rail, and the pastor led him to saving knowledge of Jesus. And as this little kid, I'm indignant. You don't wear clothing like that to come to church. You don't come into God's house with a pair of bib overalls, a blue chambray shirt, and clod hoppers that have clod on them. You don't certainly have the audacity to walk down the aisle and kneel at the prayer rail when you're dressed like that, smelling like that, looking like that. And I think perhaps that's what the Pharisee in me wants to say in this story. How is it that Jesus violates the Sabbath? How is it that this man is born blind? How is it that all of these things have happened? They have no sense of vision. They have sight, but they're blind. Once I was blind, but now I see. This man understands Jesus. Because he's encountered him personally. Can you imagine getting to heaven? You're standing outside the pearly gates, and Jesus looks at you and says, What day of the week was I born on? <laughs> you say, I, 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 I don't know. Well, I want you to know Jesus isn't going to ask you what day of the week he was born on. He's not even going to ask you what date he was born on. He is not going to ask you what month in which he was born. He's not going to ask you what the year was in which he was born. Jesus is going to look at you and ask you one question. Do you love me? And you know, the answer to that either has to be yes or no. There is no in-between in that one. Well, I kind of like you. <laughs> no, you either love Jesus or you do not. And if you love Jesus and trust him as your Savior and Lord, He's going to say, enter into your glory. He doesn't get to say how many rules and regulations are there. He's not going to say, can you identify all 613 rules and regulations that we have to understand the Ten Commandments? No. He's not even going to say, could you recite the Ten Commandments? No. Do you love me? That's the issue. Once I was blind, but now I see. I hope that with your eyes of vision, that you can see your need for a savior. And you can trust Jesus to be your savior and your Lord.
and have the insight to be able to do that. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you this day. As Jesus has ridden into Jerusalem on this Palm Sunday, we ask that he would come into our lives as well. That we would trust him to be Savior and Lord of our life. That we might see Jesus and love him also. In Jesus we pray. Amen.